This is Scott Nelson, who was facing first-degree murder charges after killing a nanny in Orlando, Florida. So you committed the worst possible crime. Nelson was recently released from a 25-year prison sentence for a bank robbery. After he was let go from his painting job, he decided to plan another robbery. Nelson broke into a house with a knife where a nanny was working as a caregiver. He kidnapped her, threw her in the trunk, and drove to a local ATM so he could withdraw cash. Nelson Nelson then drove to a remote location and stabbed her to death before ditching her body and the car, where he was later arrested. On trial, Nelson argued that the government was to blame. You bought zip ties? Yes, I did. You bought duct tape? That'd be correct. You bought a knife? I sure did. I bought that material because I had a plan in mind of how I was going to survive being thrown on the street again for what, the third or was it the fourth time by the government? And you know, you kick a dog enough times, they tend to bite back and really they just don't care anymore. Nelson continues testifying showing no emotion and finally admits to the murder. Somebody was going to pay for how you've been treated. That is very accurate. Who killed Jennifer Fulford? I did. He took the stand during the penalty phase and this is what he had to say. How has your mental health been affected by your previous incarceration. I am a homicidal maniac. In the end, Nelson was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. This is John Bunn. He spent 27 years wrongfully convicted of murder. I'm an innocent man, Your Honor, and I have always been an innocent man. While living in Brooklyn, New York, Bunn was only 14 years old when he was arrested by NYPD detective Louis Scarcella. Bunn later spent 16 years behind bars and then 11 years out on parole, where he still fought to prove his innocence. Then finally, his conviction was overturned based on the wrongdoing of Detective Scarcella and the fact that there wasn't even probable cause to arrest Bunn in the first place. I want y'all to know that. Y'all convicted and had a wrong man in prison. And after 27 years of fighting to clear his name, he is finally exonerated. I want to say thank you, Your Honor, because in the 27 years, I've been fighting for my life. But before he leaves the courtroom, he has a moment with the judge. <laughs> Bun later filed a lawsuit against the city of New York and Detective Scarcella. This is Alan McCarty, who was arrested and charged after making death threats to a judge. In a child custody case, a judge ruled against McCarty and took away his children. His erratic behavior towards the judge continued into his court appearances. Um, my dad even went the building and I look like a f***ing idiot, huh? Brought your dress today, you little f***ing prick. You wanna f***ing take my kids from me and act like that? F*** you in that over here. After McCarty was found guilty for the original threats made to a judge, we now move on to the sentencing. What a bunch of guys, you stupid piece of You threatened my life, And the, uh, you, you Back room. Suck my No, I'm not standing up. I'm resisting. I'm not resisting, I'm just not standing up. I'm not standing. I don't have to stand. McCarty is moved to another room to watch the court through a one-way glass, and he continues on making a disturbance. McCarty was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The judge also issued an additional 10-day sentence due to his actions in the courtroom. This is Markeith Lloyd, who was convicted of murdering a police officer in Orlando, Florida. Lloyd was already on the run from the police after he killed his former girlfriend, who was pregnant with his child. A month later, Lloyd is spotted in a Walmart. You can see him walking in. Moments later, Orlando Police Lieutenant Deborah Clayton pulls in. You can see her grab a cart and walk in. Reportedly, they cross paths every few minutes. Outside the store, Lieutenant Clayton was notified and she tried to stop and arrest Lloyd when a shootout begun. Lieutenant Clayton was killed during the interaction, being shot 
shot four times. Following the murder, Lowy took off again, which led to a nine-day manhunt, where he was later found. During the arrest, he tried to escape, where he lost his left eye in the altercation. Here in court, Lowy took the stand. Reportedly, he believed everyone was out to kill him. And I was just reacting, Mary. I was just reacting. Even when they opened the door, I just reacted. I just reacted. I fired two shots, I just reacted. The jury then found him guilty. It really hurts deep down. It's this is Lieutenant Clay's sister giving a victim impact statement. She stood in the place as my mother when I didn't have one. I truly miss my sister. I truly miss her. And this is the moment that Lloyd hears that the jury unanimously recommends the death sentence. We, the jury, unanimously find that the defendant, Marquis Floyd, should be sentenced to death. Lloyd seems to mouth something out to the public. A few moments later, Lloyd has an outburst. Alright, why don't we remove Mr. Lloyd from the courtroom? The judge later agreed with the jury and sent Lloyd to death, where he now sits behind bars waiting for his death sentence. This is Daryl Brooks, who is convicted of killing six people and injuring dozens of others after he drove his SUV into a Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Reportedly, during his reckless driving, he reached speeds of over 30 miles per hour, and the prosecution argued that his driving rampage was intentional. He plowed through 68 different people. He kept going until he got to the end and there was no more bodies to hit. It was intentional. After Brooks was arrested and charged, Brooks decided to represent himself in court. If you are allowed to represent yourself in this case, sir, you will not have attorneys assisting you. They're gone from this case. Do you understand that? I think I will probably be better served representing myself. Throughout the trial, Brooks was removed multiple times for constant interruptions and outbursts. It was here that his real personality was shown when he starts to laugh during a witness testimony. He told Erica that he was going to find her and he was going to kill her. Now, back in the courtroom, Brooks has an outburst as he didn't like how the district attorney pronounced the word defendant. I would like to provide the defendant and the court. So that had to be, that had to be said, the defendant. I got one ear there working, I heard that. This oh, is man. to benefit oh, you, that so it's you not, understand ain't none of this to witness. benefit me. And now, Brooks is clearly frustrated. He decides to have a stare down with the judge. I need to take a break. This man right now is having a stare down with me. It's very disrespectful. He pounded his fist. Frankly, it makes me scared. The jury quickly found Brooks guilty of all 76 charges against him. And he was given six life sentences, plus more than 700 additional years in prison. This is Jaleel Smith Riley in a Cincinnati, Ohio courtroom, who police say confessed to a robbery killing a 20 year old woman and seriously wounding her boyfriend. Portia Brooks was in her car with her boyfriend Aaron Martin when Smith Riley came up to her car with two others looking to rob them. When Smith Riley found out Martin didn't have any cash, he was shot in the head, leaving him with permanent brain damage. Smith Riley then shot at Brooks, which killed her three days later. Lord. Go back and win. This is what a couple of women. This is somebody that feels genuine remorse. This is somebody that thinks about this every day, and he knows that he can't go back in time and undo what he did. Now, Portia Brooks' mother delivers a victim impact statement. But he killed me mentally, emotionally. He killed my identity as a mother of three, as a family of four. This is now Brooks' sister speaking. I have to deal with life without Portia, so he should deal with life without, without parole. This is moments right before Jaleel Smith Riley gets the news that he will never be allowed to return home again. Can kind of serve a term of life without parole as to count for, for the offense of attempted murder. This is Michael Brady, who attempted a prison escape that resulted in the death of four prison workers at Pasquotank Correctional Institution in North Carolina. I stabbed him like four 
to eight times I hit Jeffrey Howe until he stopped moving. I don't know how many times I hit him with the hammer. Brady was facing 24 years in prison for an attempted murder conviction after he shot at a North Carolina state trooper. And four years into his sentence, Brady and three other inmates brutally murdered four prison workers with hammers and scissors. That man, Michael Brady, beat that man, George Midget, like he was trying to bust concrete. Brady then tried to hop a fence, but then was captured at gunpoint. It was like a bloodbath, and I stepped in between Jeffrey and Wendy, and I slid trying to get in because the whole elevator floor was nothing but blood. During the trial, the prosecutors argued that Brady was the one who planned the attack and had no remorse for the killings. We know who originated the plan. We know who led the plan. After Brady is found guilty, he now takes the stand at his sentencing. I'm gonna appear to tell the truth. You can ask me anything you want. I'm gonna tell the truth. Whether it hurts me, whether it helps me, I don't care about that. And you don't believe you're crazy, do you? No. I don't think I'm crazy, no. And you do know the difference between right and wrong? Yes. So you know murder is wrong? Murder is a different name for a death, but yes. Your freedom meant more than their lives. Yes. And now the judge reads out the jury's recommendation. The jury unanimously recommending that the defendant be sentenced to death. Brady seems completely emotionless, and the judge later agrees on the death penalty, where he now sits locked up in Colorado, awaiting his death sentence. This is Franklin Williams, who is convicted of multiple felonies, including armed robberies and fleeing police in Cleveland, Ohio. And on the Again, I'm gonna interrupt President. Mr. Williams. President. Listen to me. I'm gonna gag you in one second. Williams conducted three armed robberies before leading police on a high-speed chase. He was later arrested and convicted. Now, at his sentencing, Williams would not stop talking, despite more than a dozen warnings from the judge. Do you not let me that you means zip it right now. You trying to? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. That's so, a violation of the hip law, Judge. Here we go. This resulted in the judge ordering Williams' mouth to be taped shut. If you spit on, attempt to bite, or injure any of my deputies, you're going to have a bad day. There's what it is. At a following court appearance, Williams has something to share with the judge and cameras. Freedom of speech, no duct tape. With the hashtags. Aside from all the interruptions, the judge can hand down William's sentence. You face the potential maximum consecutive sentence of 134 years. I ordered a 24 year sentence. After Williams received a 24 year prison sentence, the judge later apologized for the duct tape and threw out that sentence. He then appointed a new judge, where she sentenced him to 33 years behind bars. This is Martez Abram, who was convicted on two counts of murder for the killings of two Walmart employees in South Haven, Mississippi. Abram had worked at the Walmart but was faced with a suspension after he apparently had a knife on him in the store. The day he was suspended, he returned to the store with multiple weapons and opened fire, killing store managers Anthony Brown and Brandon Gales. He was laying on the ground with his eyes open and I ran up to him he also shot an officer who survived due to his bulletproof vest. Once I got out of my vehicle, I heard gunshots and I felt the pressure of the bullet hit my back. He was arrested on site. Now in court, Abram admits to all crimes. That's you, is it, sir? Yes. Look at it, please, sir. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Gale. Is on the floor going down at this point, isn't he? Yes. Okay, and that's you shooting him, right? Yes. Look at the screen, sir. Yes. That's you shooting him. Yes. And you admit that you shot him in cold blood? Yes. You shot him again, didn't you? Yes. After that, you went back to the toilet paper all, didn't you? <laughs> yes. This is one of the victim's wife delivering a victim impact statement. We took Anthony from me on the exact day. 20 years earlier that we had our first date. And now this is when the judge will decide Abram's fate. In count one, I will sentence you to death. Count two, you will be sentenced to death. In count three, you will be sentenced to life in the penitentiary. As Abram hears that he will be receiving the death penalty, he stands silently where he now sits on death row awaiting his execution. 
This is Erica Butts and Shanita Cunningham. They were both charged with homicide by child abuse in Somerville, South Carolina. Butts, who was best friends with the child's mother, was supposed to be caring for the toddler for two weeks. The child was only three years old. She died from her injuries, reflecting weeks of torture. A time frame that matched the time she had spent with Butts and her lover at the time, Cunningham. What must have been the excruciating sounds that came from that child is more than distance to this After both women were found guilty, the judge now hands down their sentence. The court finds it appropriate that each be sentenced to the State Department of Corrections for a period of life. They were just sentenced to life in prison. <laughs> Butts and Cunningham are reportedly at separate prisons serving their life sentences. This is Keith Ferguson from Kalkaska, Michigan. He was set to court for 12 felony counts, including kidnapping and murder. How are you? Okay. Well. Ferguson, who was 40 at the time, was engaged in a divorce argument with his wife, Tiffany Ferguson when he begun to suddenly beat her, followed by fatally shooting her in front of their four children. He then hauled the children over to Tiffany's parents' house, where he fatally shot his father-in-law. After fleeing the scene, Ferguson stormed a nearby house, taking the owner hostage, and barricaded himself inside the home. After a seven-hour standoff, Ferguson was arrested. The defendant has already murdered, and murdered multiple people, and fled, and has taken hostages, during Ferguson's court appearance, his attitude and remorse towards the situation baffled everyone. All right, Mr. Ferguson, can I get you to stand up there as a podium for you? All right, I need to have you raise your right hand for me. Okay, all right. Um, Just pull me back my cell. Okay, stop. Right. Um, at his sentencing, Tiffany's best friend gives a victim impact statement, saying she always felt that Keith would hurt his wife. I knew one day he would kill her. She would always reply, he loves his kids too much. He won't kill me. He loved them so much, he murdered their mother and grandfather. When asked about his children, Ferguson never desired to see or speak to them again. The judge responded by saying, You may not meet the clinical definition of insanity, uh, but there's clearly something fundamentally wrong with you. Ferguson was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. I see y'all in hell. This is Randall Moore. He is facing three life sentences for crimes against his former wife, Therese Ann Lynch. Lynch had left her husband and filed a protective order against him. This resulted in Moore kidnapping and killing his estranged wife. Officer Todd Rowland responded to the cries from the apartment, where he was then shot and wounded. Okay, 303 Adams been hit, officer down. Suspects armed with 20 shells. Advises nobody come to the door as he will shoot again. Shortly after, Moore had a phone call with a 911 dispatcher. Listen as he explains his motives. I didn't want to do any of this. Okay. But I'm telling you, all I wanted was my son. I just wanted to see my seven month old baby. That's all I cared about. Not long after, Moore surrendered, and for Officer Roland, he underwent surgery for his hand. As the verdict is read out, Moore gives nothing but a slight nod. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of kidnapping in the first degree. Guilty of sexual abuse in the first degree. Guilty of attempt to commit murder. At Moore's sentencing, Lynch's mother gives a victim impact statement. What you did to my daughter, Teresa Ann Marie Lynch, was evil, hateful, and despicable. You are now dead and rotting and repulsive to me. Read the journal she wrote. She hated you. Thank you, Judge She hated you. Thank you. <laughs> You're a loser. Moore refused to apologize for his actions, saying he had no remorse for what happened. And I'll tell you point blank, I have not one ounce of remorse for Tree Sand's death. It could have all been prevented. All you had to do is let me see my kid. Now you're never going to see her again. But now comes the judge. If anybody didn't know what a piece of work you were before you start talking, they know it now. The court doesn't allow me to punish you any more than I'm doing now. If I could, 
I would. Moore was given a total of three life sentences plus 25 years for the attempted murder. This is David Ranta. He spent 22 years behind bars for a murder he did not commit. In Brooklyn, New York, Ranta was arrested by Detective Louis Scarcella. Ranta was put in a police lineup run by Scarcella and was identified as the shooter. But decades later, reportedly, the key witness revealed that the detective had provided him with a description of whom to pick in the lineup. There was no physical evidence linking Ranta to the killing and the evidence presented to the jury was allegedly fabricated. Ranta was then convicted and sentenced to 37 and a half years to life in prison. But after spending over two decades in prison, the former witnesses admitted that they were pressured into testifying against Ranta. And now, this is the moment his conviction gets thrown out. Mr. Ranta, to say that I'm sorry for what you have endured would be an understatement. And grossly inadequate, but I say it to you anyway. The defendant's motion to vacate the judgment of conviction is granted. After his handcuffs were removed, he hugged his family. With all he owned thrown over his back, Thank you all. Thank you. he walks out a free man. After his release, he reportedly received $2 million from the state and a $6.4 million settlement from the city of New York. This is Diana Lovejoy. She used to be married to Greg Mulvihill living in Carlsbad, California, but soon their marriage fell apart and they divorced. After a messy divorce and lots of legal trouble, it ended with the court ordering Diana to pay $120,000 to Greg for his stake in their family house. The court also ordered that she must share custody of their son. Diana became furious about hearing the court orders, so she planned to kill her ex-husband by teaming up with her boyfriend, Weldon McDavid. Greg was shot in the torso, but luckily the bullet didn't hit his heart and he survived. Both McDavid and Diana conspired to murder, and the court has sufficient evidence against them. <laughs> it's so painful that people, some people in this world seem to think that I would have it in me to do this. Interestingly, she fainted in court. She lowered her head down toward the defense table for a few seconds. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty of the crime of a attempted murder of Greg Mulvihill. <laughs> And right when you hear guilty, you hear a thud. Guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. It silenced the courtroom, aside from hearing her family cry in the background. She then is brought onto the floor. And when medics bring her out, she still appears to be passed out. But doctors later found out she had only fainted. Weldon McDavid received 50 years to life in prison because he was the one that pulled the trigger. And Diana was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. This is Bass Webb, who has been charged with two counts of attempted murder in Lexington, Kentucky. You can see on this security camera, Webb tries to run over two employees at a jail he recently served time at. Now, at his first court appearance, the judge is about to remove herself from the trial because she knew the two employees. Matters, no way I'm gonna try this case. I have any further proceedings or I have to see you for one further set. And now Webb is about to shock the courtroom. He just spit on the judge. The judge wipes the spit off and then kicks him out of the courtroom. Turns out Webb has a very dark past. When he was behind bars, he was charged for the murder of two different girlfriends. He was found guilty of the killing of the first girlfriend. Now he's on trial for the second. Webb showed up to court with a tattoo on his head that listed people he wanted to kill. At the bottom was three rats crossed out. During the trial, Webb showed no remorse and the jury found him guilty. The judge sentenced Webb to life in prison for his crimes. 
This is Kamia Gamet, who is charged with the murder of her boyfriend in Jackson, Mississippi. Reportedly, the attack happened during an argument between the two individuals, and ended with the boyfriend being violently stabbed to death. Gamet was arrested on first-degree murder charges. In court, Gamet would claim her murder was in self-defense and her boyfriend was attacking her. But in the end, she was found guilty of murder. The way I was portrayed, everything, mostly everything was lies. There was a little bit of truth, but mostly I was convicted of Lies. We now move into the sentencing, where Gamet reportedly kept interrupting the judge. You're gonna uh, shut your mouth or I'm gonna have some duct tape put on it. With Gamet showing no remorse, the judge had some final words. You stab, you stab, you stab, you stab until he was dead. I agree with the family. I hope you die in prison as well. You know, if this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. In the end, Gamet was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This is Kyandria Cook, who was found guilty of carjacking charges in Volusia County, Florida. 18-year-old Cook and her then 17-year-old boyfriend had used a dating app to set up a carjacking, where the boyfriend reportedly shot the victim, leaving him seriously injured. After fleeing the scene and being on the run, the pair attempted another carjacking just two days later, but they were arrested. Now in court, Cook stands in front of the judge for her involvement in the theft and shooting. Keeps you guilty of all three charges, sends you to 20 years in state prison. <laughs> That is Cook's mother that can be heard crying. <laughs> Reportedly, the reason for this very emotional outburst is there was a miscommunication with the assistant public defender, where Cook and her mother thought she wouldn't face any prison time. <laughs> Cook's sentence was later reduced to 11 years in prison. This is Joel Delgado. He is currently being brought to the Pulaski County Courthouse in Little Rock, Arkansas. He is brought into court to face multiple charges, including residential burglary and theft of services. Reportedly during his arrest, he claimed he was injured so he was brought to a hospital. Now, the sheriff deputy is currently escorting Delgado into the courthouse to face his charges. But steps before they enter the door, Delgado loses his shoe, which just might be a distraction for his getaway plan. Hey, you see a shoe back there? Where is it? With Delgado being in a neck brace and a wheelchair, it appears he can't walk, but he sure can run. Delgado then bolts across the street and down an alley. Oh, I'm gonna catch you, baby. I'll put a suit on. The deputy seems to lose him and searches through the streets looking for the suspect. Hey, can you call the police for me? Call the police for me. Call the police. What way it go? Straight through the alley and cut that way. What's your phone? My damn radio came. And I tried to get him. Hello? The wheelchair dude got up and ran. Yeah. I couldn't catch this. The wheelchair dude. I couldn't catch him. Yeah. After no luck, the deputy makes it back to the front of the courthouse. The wheelchair dude ran. <laughs> he had a nake brace on and all that. Did you really? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Can't need that wheelchair very much, did he? Hell no. The deputy then meets up with his colleagues and breaks the news. Dude ran, man. Dude ran. Uh, yeah. Wait. He took it off. Yeah. I couldn't catch that dude. He jumped the rail. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my camera, bro. Oh, what's that, uh, man? <laughs> he jumped the rail, kicked his, uh, his shoe and came off. I've been down to get his shoe. He just ran. Took off all you, man. Yeah. However, the suspect's freedom was short-lived, as he was caught a few hours later, where he claimed he was injured and couldn't walk again. And now, he faces an additional charge of third-degree escape. Reportedly, Delgado has pleaded not guilty to all charges against him. This is Ronnie O'Neill. He is a double murder suspect in Riverview, Florida. If you think I'm here to play around with y'all, God damn it, I'm not.
O'Neill was 29 when he fatally shot his then-girlfriend Kenyatta Barron. Following this, he murdered their own daughter by striking her multiple times with a hatchet. She was only 9 years old. O'Neill also stabbed their 8-year-old son before pouring gasoline all over the house and setting it on fire. O'Neill was arrested upon fleeing the burning house. The son was able to escape but was critically wounded and suffered from burns. The first 911 call on the incident was from the girlfriend who was heard screaming before suddenly hanging up. Eight minutes later, another call came in from O'Neill. 911, what is your emergency? Hey, I've just been attacked by some white demons inside, with this guy, Kiki. Kiki, her name is Kiki, and she tried to kill me. And What's the end? Huh? After the arrest, O'Neill was psychologically cleared to represent himself in court. During the trial, he cross-examined his now 11-year-old son, who he stabbed, to which the son explained everything that happened. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? You stabbed me. O'Neill also accused the prosecution of fabricating evidence. Because he's playing a fraudulent damn recording of me beating Kenyatta Barron. I did kill Kenyatta Barron. After O'Neill was found guilty at his sentencing, the judge went on to say this was the worst case she's ever seen. This is the worst case ever, ever in my life. And I have seen some horrors. He also stated that he was not sorry for what he did. I am not sorry for something I didn't do, and I am not sorry for the things I did do. O'Neill was given a total of three life sentences plus 90 years without parole. And for O'Neill's son, he was adopted by the detective who cared for him the night of the murders. This is Esteban Carpio. The police were questioning him for the stabbing of an 85-year-old woman in Rhode Island. In the interview room was Carpio and two detectives. One of the detectives left the room to get water for Carpio, leaving just him and Detective Sergeant James Allen in the room. Carpio grabbed Allen's gun and then shot him twice, killing him. He then jumped out of a window which was three stories high and made a run for it, but was apprehended just 45 minutes later. At his arraignment, Carpio came in wearing a mask designed to stop the offender from spitting and biting at others. With also his face being in rough shape, it stunned the courtroom. It wasn't so much Carpio with the shocking reaction, more so his family members, making accusations of police brutality. <laughs> It's Bruce police brutality. He was mentally ill and he needed help and we couldn't get it. We tried and tried. And he didn't deserve this. An FBI investigation concluded that the police did not use excessive force and that Carpio's injuries were sustained due to his jump from the third floor of a building and struggle with law enforcement. Every day I face the facts of what I did and what happened. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. This is Callum Fitner in Bradford Crown Court in the UK. He's here to help support his 17 year old friend who is currently on the other side of this door and he's about to burst through and make a run for it. The teenage escapee you see was reportedly just sentenced to 21 weeks in custody for the theft of a mobile phone. But keep your eye on Fitner, as he's about to press the button for an automatic door to open, leading his friend to freedom. First goes the teenager, then one, two, three, four security officers chasing the suspect. And it appears Fitner takes a different route out of the building. The teenage phone bandit makes it out of the courthouse and is gone. And it appears the security officers lost him. And for Fitner, he walks out casually hopping down the steps like nothing ever happened. 
The teenager was on the run for two days when he was arrested and sentenced to an extra six months in jail for the escape. Fittner pleaded guilty to aiding and abetting his friend's escape and was jailed for three months. This is Jessica Groves, who along with her husband, Daniel Groves, are both charged with the murder of their own two-month-old child in Portsmouth, Ohio. Tell the jury how you killed this baby. It was an accident. Not your excuse. How did you murder this baby? How did you cause these injuries? Reportedly, when the father found the child unresponsive, he later testified he didn't alert authorities because his wife threatened to blame him. That's when the child's body was found at the bottom of a 30-foot well inside a milk crate wrapped in plastic. Reports found that the child suffered fractures to his skull, arms, ribs, and leg. The mother and father had initially pleaded not guilty, but in a shocking twist, Miss Groves takes full responsibility for the killing of the child. Jessica, did you and you only cause the death of your son, Dylan Groves? Yes. Did Daniel Groves participate in the killing of Dylan? No. Was Daniel Groves aware of any of the injuries that you caused that may have led to his death? No. Did you hide all injuries that you caused Dylan from your husband? Yes. Prosecutors initially claimed they were both responsible for the child's death, and now they demand the truth. How did you murder this baby? How did you cause these injuries? I have sit here and admitted. Answer the question, please. How did you cause these injuries? It was an accident. Not your excuse for what happened. How did you cause these injuries? By dropping him. How did you cause that <coughs> first two-inch skull fracture? I don't remember. I've admitted to my guilt. How did you call? And I have to live without my children. I'm done talking to you. You are talking to me because you're sitting on the witness stand. Tell them how you called that injury. Miss Groves is unable to remember how the child was killed, but she claimed she is a sole reason for the child's murder and acted alone. My client, Jessica Groves, was and still is a drug addict. There is no doubt about that fact. She and she alone caused the injuries to Dylan Groves, which led to his death. She murdered Dylan Groves. Groves was found guilty on all 11 counts and was given life in prison with no possibility of parole. Her husband was cleared of aggravated murder, but he was found guilty on the remaining 10 charges and was sentenced to 47 years to life in prison. This is Kimberly Long, who was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison for a murder she never committed in Riverside, California. Long arrived home and discovered her boyfriend dead. She immediately called 911. Despite being the person who found the dead body, Long ended up becoming the lead suspect. She was soon convicted of second degree murder and sent to prison. But seven years later, forensic evidence showed that her boyfriend died long before she had arrived at the scene, and there was DNA of of an unknown male at the crime scene. The conviction now gets overturned. The judgment of conviction is vacated and a new trial will be ordered. <laughs> Long is now outside of prison. The prosecution soon dropped all existing charges. I feel um, happy, elated, relieved, um, just a lot of emotions right now. Long reportedly received $386,000 from the California Victim Compensation Fund. This is Anthony Kirkland, who is a convicted serial killer in Cincinnati, Ohio. They say I am evil and a monster. They're right. Even my mom hated me, but I don't blame her. Kirkland had previously served a 16-year prison sentence for the killing of his ex-girlfriend. A few years after his release, Kirkland begun his killing spree. Over a three-year period, he killed four women, two of them being teenagers. Kirkland was arrested after his fourth murder as he was caught with one of the victim's watch and iPod, which made him a lead suspect. Eventually, police were able to pin all the murders to Kirkland. Now in court, as the charges are being read out, Kirkland is facing the death penalty, and next, he appears to faint. Count four, aggravated murder. Kirkland was later found guilty on all charges and sentenced to death. He is currently on death row awaiting his execution at the Chillicothe Correctional Facility. 